Psalm 103, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Today's title is Divine Redemption. We're going to look at the benefit of divine redemption. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you're present in our life. And Lord, we thank you above all that you have redeemed us and called us to yourself. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us and help us to see just the enormity of what you have done, the gravity by which you've done it, and the great love in which you moved. So Lord, we honor you today and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now there's a story told, and this happened a long time ago, but there's a story told of a boy who with his dad built a little sailboat. But y'all know it's kind of like, um, uh, and when I say that, I mean not like a little Lego. I mean like he got out the wood, the lathe, the materials, and started cutting. They made even like little captains, and they made little crew members, and this was a highly detailed boat, and this kid loved the boat. As much because he made it, but as much because he made it with his dad. And, and it seemed like almost every day this boy played with the boat and he was always doing it. You know, he was young. He was always playing with the boat. And one day he was down by the river and he played with the boat and, and they built the boat so good that actually when the wind blew, it took the boat away. And the boat went down, down river and he tried to get to it, but he couldn't get to it. And he lost his boat and he was heartbroken. He, he cried. He was upset. He was devastated by the loss and it was gone. And about six months later, the boy and the father are visiting a town about 30 miles away. His dad had work there and they were, they were going in town and this was, this was back in the day. And so they were going there and, and they were walking down the town, uh, down kind of the main street of town. And in one of the windows of a shop, of a pawn shop, the boy looked over and saw his boat. And he snatched his hand from his dad. He said, that's my boat. And he ran into the pawn shop. And y'all know what a pawn shop is, right? A pawn shop is a place where people will go and they sell property, right? So that they can secure a loan. And if they can't pay that loan back, the pawn shop owns that property, right? So the boy sees this. And then, and, and he sees this boat. And he sees his boat, not just any boat, but his boat. So he runs in and he goes into the window and he grabs the boat and he says, that's my boat. And of course, the store manager says, well, wait a second, that's my boat. I paid for that boat. Someone brought that boat in and, and I paid for it. It's my boat. And if you want that boat, you're going to have to pay for that boat. And the boy's like, you don't understand. Me and my dad built this boat. We made this boat. We painted this boat. See that captain? That's Captain Silly Face. I don't know. I'm just making that up. But, but we made this boat. Like, this is my boat. I want this boat. And and, and the man said, well, you can have the boat for a price. And the dad overheard the conversation because by now he had got in there, saw the excitement of his son, heard the conversation, the exchange between the shopkeeper and the son. And he calls the boy over and says, here you go. And he gives him the money so that he can buy his boat back. So the boy with great joy gives the money to the shopkeeper, takes his boat and they're walking out of the store and he's holding on to his dad's hand. And his dad hears him exclaim, you are my boat. I built you once and I bought you once and now I'm never letting you go. Now I'm never letting you go. This is what God has done for us. We were lost. We were gone. We were far from God. We were sold into sin. We were, we were paraded by the devil as his property. And Jesus saw us and Jesus came and said, no, that's my person. That's my son. That's my daughter. That's my brother. That's my sister. The father said, okay, we're going to pay for it. We're going to pay the price to redeem you, to buy you back, to, to bring you back home. This is exactly the message of the cross. This is the message of the scripture. And today we're going to look at one of the biggest, one of the best, one of the most wonderful blessings, I think, that comes in God's divine benefit package. We're going to talk about redemption. Now, Merriam-Webster gives us uh, the def some various definitions of redemption. I'm going to read a couple of them to you. It means to buy back or to get or win back. To buy back or to get or win back. Another definition is to free from what distresses or harms. That sounds good, doesn't it? 
to free you from what distresses or harms. Another definition is to release from blame or debt. A release from bl blame or debt. And then, the, and then the next one is to free from the consequences of sin. Now, I know redemption is a kind of theological term nowadays. It's kind of, or, or if we use it, we use it like you redeem your ticket for something, right? You redeem it for a prize. But what, we're, what we, we miss sometimes is just the power of redemption. We miss the, the power of being freed from debt, the power of being freed from the consequences of sin, the power of being freed from that which would harm us, the power of what God actually did through the work of the cross. And the truth is, is that when we look at our lives, we have to understand one thing, and that is this, we can't redeem ourselves. We can't redeem ourselves from the pain. We can't redeem ourselves from the sorrow. We can't redeem ourselves from the failures. We can't redeem ourselves from the consequences, can we? But God is our redeemer, and he offers us redemption through his son. And when we receive that benefit, we get true freedom, true freedom. And this freedom releases a gratitude in us that can't be, can't be contained. It, it, it gives us a new agency in our lives. And you know what I mean when I say that? It means that you are actually free to decide and free to act. You know, uh, I know we have a lot of, of uh, servicemen and women in this congregation. And I thank you all for your service. And I, I remember my own experience with the military, and that's this, is that once I got out of the military, I appreciated my freedom so much more. Because when you're in, you're not free. Amen? They tell you what to wear. They tell you when to get up. They tell you what you're going to do. And they do that all day long, every day. Every day. Guess what you're going to eat? Whatever they give you. Guess where you're going to go? Wherever they tell you. Guess when you're going to do it? At zero dark 30, whenever they want you to. You can't just go and do what you want. But when you get out, you understand the value of your freedom. You understand the difference between what I want to do and what I, what I have to do. Or what I don't have to do. You, you're full of gratitude. Why? Because you know what? Listen, if you've slept in the dirt for days on end and you stink to high heaven because all you got is a wet nap to clean yourself or a, 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 a canteen full of water to wash yourself off with, you are thankful for a shower, praise God. You are thankful for a roof over your head, praise Jesus. I'm telling you, whenever I cut my grass, I am thankful I got grass to cut in Jesus' name. That I ain't sleeping in the grass. Right? There is something about the freedom that comes when you understand when you are totally free. There are things I can do, but I don't do because I don't have to because I'm free. There is food I could eat and maybe would eat if I had to survive. But guess what? There is plenty of food. I say, I, I ain't eating that because I don't want to because I'm free. Listen, when you get redemption from God, you are free on a level that allows you to say, no, I don't need that. No, I don't want that. I am free to choose what I'm going to do, how I'm going to live. And, I, and because I have been freed, like truly freed, I am grateful to the God who redeemed me, to the one who saved me, to the one who pulled me out of the pit and set my foot on a, on a solid ground. I am grateful. And because I am grateful, I lean towards him. When you receive redemption from God, you're going to be free. And I mean truly free to choose God and the good life. Amen? How many of y'all watch the uh, Avengers movies? Anybody? How many of y'all have no idea what the Avengers movies are? Just check it. Okay, a few, a couple. So Avengers are some comic book heroes, and there's been some really popular movies in the last few years, uh, probably the last, what, 10 years now, 12 years now, just a series after series of superhero movies. And in the Avengers, there's one particular character whose who's, uh, code name is Black Widow, right? Y'all know who I'm talking about? Black Widow, right? And, and y'all remember what Black Widow's thing was? She didn't want red in her ledger, right? You remember that? She, she, she did things. See, see the, kind of the, 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 the hidden agenda under her was, I'm not going to owe nobody nothing. And that, and that kind of theme follows through that why is she connected with who she's connected or why is she doing what she's doing? It's because she either wants to avoid going in debt to someone or she's paying off a debt to someone. 
But the bottom line is, is she doesn't do things uh, be, to, to, because she doesn't want red in her ledger. And I think to some degree, we all do the same thing. We're motivated, we're moved by whether or not we're going to go into debt. And I'm talking about social debt or relational debt, even financial debt. We do things to stay out of debt, don't we? But when we, when we get into debt, let's say we cross the line, let's say we sin, let's say we come up short, let's say we mess up, then we have this kind of internal sense that things are out of order and that we owe God or we owe others, right? I mean, how many of us have messed up and then said, oh God, I'll never do it again if you just forgive me this one time? Or, or, or you're driving down the road and you see that cop and you know you're going too fast and you immediately pray, oh God, please, this is one time I'll never speed again. Because instantly you're aware that you broke some rule, didn't you? Instantly you know that now you're in the hole. When you, when you say that wrong thing to a person, what does it make you want to do? Get it right. It makes you want to fix it. This awareness of there's a debt, there's a gap, it, it, it motivates us. It, it almost compels us. The only kind of person that I'm aware of that it doesn't work on is narcissists. But every normal person has a sense when, when, when there's red in the ledger. And unfortunately for us, no matter how hard we try, at some point we're to discover that the moral debt we owe is just too great. I mean, think about it in natural terms. How many of us have, have messed up in a relationship? And no matter how hard we've tried to get it right, to fix it. We've asked for forgiveness. We've repented. We've, we've gone the extra mile. We've done everything. We've walked on pins and needles, you know, walked on eggshells. We just did everything we could to make it right. And for that person, it's still not enough. What about with God? I mean, how many times have we, have we just fallen short of the glory of God, right? Isn't that what the Bible says? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And we're aware of it though. We know it though. I mean, for some of us, I just want to applaud your bravery today because you came to church because some of us carry this weight of guilt that's so heavy, the devil wants to burden us with shame that it's hard to come to church on a Sunday because of how Friday went or because of how Saturday went or how last Tuesday went, right? Sometimes it's hard for us because we know there is a gap. We know there's a debt and we know we can't pay it off. But we try, don't we? We work hard. We get gifts. We, you know, uh, if you're spiritual, you do things like asceticism and, and you do self-denial. And, you know, in some religions, they get crazy and they do like self-flagellism where they beat themselves or they punish themselves. In relationships, we, we go above and beyond and we just try to overcorrect, overcorrect. And it just never seems to work. It never seems to pick it up. Not working harder, not greater piety or. What we need to do is discover the power of the biblical narrative, like not just the story itself, but the power behind it for us personally. God is our redeemer. God paid the price that we couldn't pay. That's the story of scripture from book, from cover to cover. It's the story of cosmic redemption. You have creation, you have sin, you have the fall, you have the curse, the consequence of sin, the consequence of the fall, but then you have, and then you have bondage, but then you have redemption, and then you have restoration. Think about it. From beginning to end, even creation is subject to the consequences of the decisions we've made. But the story of Scripture is that Jesus has come to restore. Jesus has come to redeem, to buy back and bring us back into relationship, back into our purpose, back into what we were called and created to do. This story is a story of a loving God stepping in and paying the price to buy freedom for those who are in bondage from cover to cover. Titus 2.14 in the New Testament is part of kind of a, a, a conversation between the Apostle Paul and Titus. And I want to read verse 14 because it highlights three things that we're going to look at today. Paul talking of Jesus says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. 
This verse kind of gives us three aspects of redemption that apply to us today. We're, re- we're redeemed from something, we're redeemed for something, and we're redeemed to something. So these are going to be our points. So point number one, redemption from. Redemption from something. We'll, we'll talk about that something. Look at verse four again from Psalm 103. It says, who redeems your life from destruction. The first thing we need to understand is we're being redeemed from destruction. And scripture offers us a list of destructive things that we all experience in our lives. I'm going to give a couple of them to you. The first one, sin. Psalm 130 verse 8 says, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. God will redeem you from your sin. But the starting point of our destruction is sin. Sin is the thing that brought on the fall. Sin is the thing that creates the debt that separates us from God and from others. When we sin against God, we're separated from God. When we sin against others, we create a gap between us and them and we need to be redeemed from the cost of sins. Another form of destruction that's at loose in our life is the curse. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on the tree. The curse we need to be redeemed from is evil and corruption that follows the fall. The breaking of the law is called lawlessness. Lawlessness is defined in scripture as sin. So sin is breaking the law. Law, Lawlessness is not keeping God's word. And the result of that is the curse in our lives. That curse is a corruptive thing. That curse, I honestly think if we're looking at at science, it's got to deal with the, the law of thermodynamics where things start deteriorating, things start falling apart. I don't know if creation was eternal, but I do know this, that as soon as the fall thing, death entered the world corruption entered the world. Things that once were perfect, things that once were good, God called all those things good, suddenly got tainted. That's the curse. The next path of destruction that's released in our lives is bondage. Bondage. Micah 6, 4 says, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And even though typified here in the scripture is Israel's literal bondage to Egypt, when we come under sin, the Bible tells us we come under bondage to the flesh, the world, and the devil. We we come under demonic oppression. We come under bondage to the world system, to the cultural moment, to, to the attitudes and mindsets of the people around us. And we come under the, 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 the power of disordered desire of the flesh. We want We grasp, we desire, we yearn for things that are not good for us. This is what it means to be in bondage. And then finally, death. Hosea 13, 14, God says, I will ransom from them, them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. I love that. God is saying, okay, You release plagues on people, I'm going to release plagues on you. You bring destruction to people's lives, I'm going to destroy you. See, finally, we need redemption from death. Death is the price of sin. Isn't that what the Bible says? The wages of sin is death, right? You know, desire when it's it's, uh, uh, temptation, when it's acted on, conceives sin, and sin when it's birth leads to death. Each of these things are at work in our lives. They represent the great debt that we find in our lives, but God steps in and redeems us from each of these things. Aren't you glad God redeems you from destruction? Aren't you happy today that God has redeemed you from sin, redeemed you from the curse, redeemed you from death? I say this with a straight face. I absolutely deserved hell with the way I live my life the way I I made decisions, the way I treated people, the way I I abused things, the way I did things, the way I lived my life was well-deserving of hell. And at one point, I was even arrogant arrogant enough to, to celebrate that idea. And then I met Jesus. And I saw just how horrible I was, just how terrible. 
my sin had brought destruction into my life and the life of others. And I found a God who was willing to pay the price and deliver me from those things. And he brought me out of darkness and he set me on the rock. He dug me out of the, I mean, he pulled me out of the mucky, dirty, nasty life I was living. And he cleaned me and he clothed me and he made me stand in a good place. Why? Because he redeemed me from destruction. I don't know what your story is today, but I want to tell you that if you put your faith in Jesus, he, have re- he has redeemed you, bought you out of these things so that you are no longer doomed to them. And that's good news today, amen? amen. Point number two, there's redemption for something. Redemption for. Ephesians 1.11 says this, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. See, just as we are redeemed from something, we're redeemed for something. Our redemption brings us into the inheritance of God for our lives and his purpose for our life. And that purpose is good. You, you notice that in this verse here in Ephesians 1.11, it says that uh, we've been predestined or, or chosen for the purpose of, of him who does what? Who works all things. What does Romans 8, 28 say? It says that God is bringing, working together all things for the good of those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. See, God has redeemed you for a purpose and that purpose is good. All things God is working out in your life for your good. God has called you and separated you for a purpose, for a reason. When you are bound, when you are chained, when you were a slave to sin and abound to the devil, you could not be free to live out your purpose. You could not choose to do what you were called and created to do. But in the redemption of Christ, you are now free to decide who you will serve, what you will do, and how you will do it. Amen? Our redemption brings us an inheritance, a glory. Romans, or in Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. You have been called to freedom. Only don't use your liberty or your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Galatians 5.13, but, to, but through love serve one another. He said, what? You've been called to liberty, but don't use your liberty on yourself selfishly, but use your liberty to serve your purpose, to serve God and to serve others. You're redeemed so that you're free to walk in your purpose and do good works. I mean, how many times are we unable to do something because we, we, we feel like we can't or we're not free? Uh, let's put it this way. How many times have you been in a situation and you hear about a family that's struggling or you see an individual that's struggling and you want to help them, but you don't have any money? You don't have a means to do so. You're not free or all you have is that $20 you got that's going to pay for your gas to get you home. You want to help, you want to do good, you, 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 you really have a desire to, but you're not able to, are you? You're not free to. I wonder how many of us are not living in our purpose because we don't feel free to pursue the purpose of God for our lives. We're bound by someone else's expectation. We're bound by cultural uh, uh, conformity. We're bound by the, the, the pullings and the pressings of the flesh. I was watching a show yesterday, and, and uh, on the show, it was, uh, there was a science fair, and one of the kids was just basically bound by her mother's determination that she was going to go to the best schools and win all the prizes. And so throughout the kind of episode, the mom was basically running the, uh, the, the science fair experiment, and the girl was just playing along. And ultimately, what it came down to is she was just trying to live the life her mother expected her to live. So she wasn't free to live her own life. I wonder how many of us are not free according to the purpose of free to live according to the purpose of God because we're 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 bound by someone else's expectation. When you receive redemption through Jesus, you are redeemed for purpose. You are redeemed so that you can be who you were created to be, to live the life that God planned for you and purposed you for you before you were formed. You are truly free to live as God designed, as God desired. You're free to step into your purpose and make a difference in the world. Revelation 
5, 9, and 10 says, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Why were we redeemed? We were redeemed to reign with God, to serve God as kings and priests, to carry out the kingdom, to make a difference. You are redeemed so you can walk in your purpose. God wants you to walk in your purpose. God wants you to live the life you were created for. God wants you to rule and reign, to be the head and not the tail, to be above and not beneath, to walk in righteousness and holiness and bring goodness into the earth. You are redeemed for that so that you are not limited in your capacity to do good, so that you are not hindered in your ability to be who God created you to be. Amen? Amen. And then finally, point number three, redemption two. Redemption to something. So we have redemption from, redemption for, redemption to. Galatians 4, 5 says, to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. The purpose of the redemption was so that we could be adopted. God redeemed us from destruction and God redeemed us for purpose. But possibly the very best, the most wonderful aspect of this divine benefit of redemption is that we're redeemed to a special relationship with God. You and I, th think about this, you and I, creation, Lowly creation, sinners, broken people, messed up people, people with failures, people with mistakes, people that don't have a lot of good in our lives. Through the redemption of God, get to be adopted into the household of God. Get to be his sons and his daughters. Get to be co-heirs with Christ. Get to rule and reign with the God of the universe over all of creation. Isn't that amazing? I don't know about you, but I think there should be some praise going on in this place right now. Because think about it. If you are taken from where you are here on the earth and God has elevated you to be seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus to rule and reign with him forever. That's a blessing, y'all. That's an amazing truth, y'all. But the real power of redemption is you've been given the freedom to choose. This is the key. You don't by default get to sit on the throne. Amen? You don't by default get to rule and reign. But you have to choose. Romans 6, 14 through 22. I'm going to read in the Message Bible to mix it up a little bit, but I love this. It says, sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. So since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live any old way we want? Since we're in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. Right? It's like heroin, right? You take that one hit and you're hooked forever. But offer yourselves to the ways of God and the freedom never quits. All your lives, you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one who commands, whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time, the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. How much... Different is it now as you live in God's freedom, your life's healed and expansive in holiness. As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing you're proud of now. Where did it get you? A dead end. But now that you've found that you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do, and have discovered the light of listening to God telling you, what a surprise, a whole, healed, put together life right now with more and more life on the way. God does not force you to choose him. He frees you to choose him. I'm gonna say that again because it's really important. God does not force you 
to choose him, but he frees you so that you can choose him. The redemption we find in Jesus delivers us from bondage to the world, to the flesh, to the devil, and it offers us the option to truly love God and live for him. We're free to choose who or what we're going to love and serve. And you're really free now. And when you choose to love God and trust in him, you enter in the hope of redemption and even better, an eternal relationship with God. God loves you. And ultimately, he redeems you to be free to love him and to choose him. Not compels you, not forced. Again, God does not put you in bondage just because he paid off your bills, your sin debt, amen? God pays it off and says, if you want to follow me, if you want to live with me, if you want to be my family, come. Isn't that what Jesus said? Come follow me. Did he force anybody? But he freed him, didn't he? I want you to walk away today knowing that God paid the price so that you would freely be able to choose how you want to live. To choose whether you want life or death. To choose whether you want purpose or bondage. You were freed. Because God loves you and he wants you to be free to choose. The benefit of divine redemption is an incredible one. Faith in Christ leads to redemption from destruction. Aren't you glad he paid the price? Aren't you glad on the cross that he died the death that we deserved? He took the wrath of God. He took the justice of God. We're redeemed for purpose so that we can live the life that we were created to live, that we were called to live, that we were gifted to live and equipped to live. And we're redeemed to have a relationship with God as his children. And if we choose to receive this gift, this benefit, and walk in these things, then we're going to experience true freedom. And we're going to recognize the great price that was paid for it. See, when you receive redemption, something changes. When you receive Jesus, something in you changes. You weren't redeemed by money. I love what it says in Isaiah 52, 3. You weren't redeemed by money. God says, I will pay the price for you, but not with money. You know what you were redeemed by? The precious blood of Jesus. You were redeemed by the most valuable thing that's ever existed in all of creation. You were redeemed not for money the debt that you incurred, the the debt that I owed, the debt that I created by my sin against God and against people could not be paid with money. I could not buy my way out. I could not work my way out. I couldn't fight my way out. I couldn't do anything to get out of it. All I could do was stand there hopeless, doomed for destruction until God stepped in and said, I'll pay, I'll pay. But he didn't pay with money. He paid with his blood. He gave life for death. So great was the love of God that he was willing to pay the price. So this gift, this benefit, I almost just feel like I want to beg you today to honor this gift. Receive the benefit of divine redemption. Understand that you are no longer doomed to destruction, that God does not hate you and God doesn't want to cast you out for your sins and God doesn't want to let sin and curse and death and bondage come on you. God wants you free. God wants you to walk in your purpose, so walk in your purpose because you're free. And best of all and most of all, God doesn't want slaves. God wants children. So choose to know God. Choose to love God. Choose to be in relationship with him because that's what the benefit of divine redemption is all about. Amen? As we close, I just want you to take a moment to bow your heads and ask God, what is he saying to you in this message? Father, I thank you today for the gift of redemption. Lord, I think think most everyone would agree with me. We love redemptive stories because we see ourselves in them. People with great potential, making great great decisions that lead to great failures, only to have a change of circumstances a fresh opportunity, a new start. Father, I thank you that you said that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things pass away and behold, all things become new. 
The old man is doomed to death and destruction, but the new man is is not doomed, but is blessed with life and peace. And even better than that, finds a place in your house. So today, Father, I ask you to make the reality of this benefit of divine redemption something we live, something we experience, something we know, not just theoretically, not just on paper, but in practice, in reality. In Jesus' name, amen.